Good morning and welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church. We are a church where we make followers of Jesus Christ through loving God, loving others, and serving the world in mission. We're so glad that you are here with us this morning. I am Annalise, I'm one of the pastors here, and I will be with you all in the Facebook comments today, so if you've got prayer requests or anything like that, you can let us know, and we will share those prayer requests later on in our service. Also, if you are new to us, there is a digital contact card that is linked there on the Facebook page. You can fill that out and let us get to know you a little better. So we are so glad that you are with us in worship today, and we are going to start off with our call to worship, and you will hear, hopefully, the voices of our uh, wonderful tech team and our musicians and Pastor Kirk on the congregational pieces. So let us now join together in our call to worship. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all, the earth is full of your creatures. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have being. And now let us join together in our opening prayer. Creator, spirit, and giver of life, make the dry, bleached bones of our lives live and breathe and grow again, as you did of old. Pour out your spirit upon the whole creation. Come in rushing wind and flashing fire to turn the sin and sorrow within us into faith, power, and delight. Amen. Now please enjoy this opening song by our praise band.
Good morning. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here this morning. And our scripture today is from Romans chapter 8, beginning with the 18th verse. Hear now the word of our God. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written. For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And now let us worship God with the giving of our gifts. You can do that through the donate button there on your Facebook page. You can text to give at the number there on the screen. You can visit our church's website on the giving page. You can also just mail in your offering. And we also always want to say, if you're a part of another community of faith, thank you for worshiping with us, but we encourage you to donate, uh, to give your gifts, to support your own community of faith. Now let us worship God as we offer our gifts and join together in listening to this wonderful music.
Today we conclude our worship series called When Bad Things Happen. We've looked at possible reasons for the trouble that befalls us. We've looked at possibility of the devil or some force of evil in creation. We've looked at our own human responsibility, our own sinfulness that causes bad things to happen. And today we will examine chaos. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you are the one who loves us through all things. Today we ask that you speak to us in the midst of our current confusion to remind us of your presence. As we struggle to find answers, Lord, remind us that you are here and that you love us and one day you will deliver us. But most of all, remind us of your presence. Open us to the movement of your spirit where we are worshiping this morning. In Christ's name, amen. I was first introduced to the concept of chaos as a child on television. And back in the 1960s, the parents would say, yeah, that's the source of most chaos, television. But it was a particular television show called Get Smart. The writers were... To become famous later, they were Buck Henry and Mel Brooks. Buck Henry was one of the original writers of Saturday Night Live. Mel Brooks became famous with films such as Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein and High Anxiety. But this show uh, was a parody on things like the James Bond films, the, the spy genre that was popular in, in entertainment at the time. And so this was all, all for fun, and the show has left us with memorable phrases like, missed it by that much, spoken by Agent 86, Maxwell Smart. But what I, what was interesting was the protagonists were organized in an organization called Control, patterned after our Central Intelligence Agency. And the antagonist was this group here that you see on the screen, Chaos, spelled with a K, I suppose just to drive English teachers crazy. Just the concept that there's this organization, an international organization of evil, they called themselves, just some kind of personified, identifiable group of people that were causing all the trouble in the universe. And it was funny to think of chaos in that way, but the reality is chaos is no laughing matter. Chaos is those random events that seem to just come upon us. This, the idea of a disorganized universe that causes immeasurable pain. Biblically, it is represented in the first Old Testament references as, as water. You see it here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind or spirit or breath from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's a powerful image coming through here that the universe is filled with randomness, a formless void, waters that are filled with mystery, chaos. And in the midst of that, God speaks, and the Word of God brings order. Let there be light, and there was light. It is God who brings order in the midst of a universe that has within it chaos. And yet as God creates and brings order, there still, in our day, there remains disorder, chaos that causes pain, hurricanes. They've always been with us, right? Lightning strikes and resulting wildfires across the American West, tornadoes, plagues, pandemics, seemingly random things going on in the universe, and we really can't explain where they come from, why they exist. Oh yes, science helps us to understand some of the what's and the whys, but ultimately, why do these things exist? Not just the ones on a global scale, but those individualized episodes of chaos like cancer, strokes, dementia, tragic accidents. 
Even St. Paul acknowledges the existence of of chaos or or something wrong within creation that needs redemption. Listen to what he says here in Romans 8, verses 19 to 23. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. You see, St. Paul is talking about, yes, our redemption, and that's the overarching theme in much of Romans and also here in Romans 8. But he reminds us that we are a part of creation. We are creatures. We're not the creator, right? We're just creatures. We're a part of this universe that God has created. And in the midst of this creation, there there seems to be built within it this disorder, this chaos. Everything decays. Our bodies aren't here forever. Yes, they're the early years of our lives where we get stronger and we learn more and, we, we, and yet we hit another part of life where everything just seems to fall apart, right? I'm hitting those years where the older I get, the more things seem to be falling apart. You love that, at least I do, I love that phrase that Paul talks about where the whole creation is groaning in labor pains, just waiting with great expectation for something, a new birth to happen where this world is no longer falling apart, but is, is, is put back in its right order and becomes dependable. In the meantime, everything just decays. Human beings, plants, right? They have a life cycle. They, they come and they grow, and then they decay and return all those chemicals to the earth. Even buildings have a life cycle. I didn't realize that until I was much older. I, I have a friend who works for the Army Corps of Engineers who was telling me about this, this book that he had read called Rubble, and the, the life expectancy of a building in the United States is about 35 years. You know, even mortar has to be pointed up. Roofs have to be fixed. Water heaters have to be replaced. Buildings will eventually fall apart. Even though we think we're building something permanent, no, it will decay. It seems the universe itself has within it this this tendency to just break apart. If you go back into the archives of my own high school yearbook, you'll, you, you will find that in my little senior quote, I quoted a baseball player known as Tug McGraw. Most people know his son, Tim McGraw, the country singer, as being more famous. But Tug McGraw had just come off you know, a, a great moment of his career. His team had won the World Series, and he'd had a big part of that. And the sports writers were all around him. How does it feel to win the World Series and to have done everything you did? And you have to know Tug McGraw. What he said was, in billions of years, scientists have determined that the earth will have moved so far away from the sun that the earth will freeze and all known life will perish. And by that time, who cares? Yes, that's my quote in my high school yearbook because I just had that, you know, adolescent attitude at the time. But you hear what he's saying. The universe itself eventually spins out of control. We know that's coming. And what do you do with that? How do we interpret chaos? Any of us who've who've had to really read through the fine print of an insurance policy, the insurance contract in itself talks about acts of God. And as a pastor, I always shudder. Why are you saying that's an act of God? And they're referring to tornadoes, hurricanes, and these kinds of things where a building might be destroyed, property will be destroyed. It's an act of God? Really? Is that how we interpret chaos? It is God who brings order into chaos, not the other way around. Still, if God created the universe and brings order, then then why does God allow chaos to even exist? And this is the same with our personal struggles with chaos. We, we end up asking God, God, why did this stroke happen? Why is my loved one suffering from dementia? Why do we have cancer? And the problem that I have with chaos is 
where do you take your anger? Where do you take your feelings when you're hurting? When, when there's no one or no thing to blame, there's no person to blame, maybe we get angry with God, and I'll tell you, in my own journey, God's big enough to take your anger. I've been there. God continues to love you. But it's so hard. I, I feel like punching the air. You know, I want to take my anger, my feelings somewhere, and with chaos, there's no place to take it. And talk about chaos. What about a pandemic? I've never lived through anything like this, that we cause such things as not being able to be with a congregation in worship. We have to do this virtually. And then there's the death toll. You know, recently we remembered September 11. We will always remember September 11, 2001, and we should. But here we are in the midst of something that has taken roughly 100 times the number of lives lost. And I, I get frustrated at the humans who we, we know what we can do to at least slow the virus. We can, you know, avoid meeting in large crowds. We can wear our masks. We can stay socially distant. And yet there are still people who refuse. When 200,000 people nearly now have died. So, yes, we can do better. But underneath it all, it's still just chaos. A virus that for whatever reason, attacks the human body, and, and it's, it's worse than the common cold. It, 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 it's more fatal. It's more infectious. And why? What do we do with it? When bad things happen like this, there's no explanation, and we feel powerless against it. And I find at times like these, sometimes when I don't know what the answers are, I, I like to reflect on what we do know. What do we know? Two things, one of which is reaffirmed in our scripture this morning. In the midst of all this mystery and chaos, God never leaves us alone. Listen again to Romans 8, 37 through 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, even chaos, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing separates us from God's love. Not whatever we're going through called a pandemic, not even death itself separates us from God's love. So in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of all these unanswerable questions, know that you are never alone. Know that you are loved by the very one who created you. The one who holds all these mysteries in the palm of his hand. That's powerful, isn't it? For me, it's enough to get me through. Trusting that God will deliver and in the midst of all of this, God still loves me. Still in the midst of that, there's a temptation to say, well, what do we do with that? In the meantime, do we just resign ourselves to the power of chaos and evil in the universe and just do nothing? There's something else I've come to learn. That Christians are not to do nothing. I know months ago we did a series on Fred Rogers, you know, and uh, one of the, the phrases that I learned from him, this is one of his quotes, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news, and my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. You know who those people are. They are the children of God, the people who've learned from Jesus. As St. Paul said in this morning's scripture in verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for what? The revealing of the children of God, the helpers. The people who in the midst of pain and anxiety are instruments of God's healing grace. We, number one, we know that God is with us. Number two, we know that God calls us to not just sit on our hands, but do whatever we can to be instruments of God's healing grace in the world. 
I learned this from an eight-year-old girl. I was serving a church in Richmond, Virginia, and a hurricane, a hurricane named Katrina had hit New Orleans and the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and southern Alabama, very close to where Sally hit just recently. It was one of those times as a pastor where I had everything prepared for worship. I'd already written my sermon and everything, and I think the hurricane hit on Thursday or Friday, and I just threw the sermon out the window and dealt with this thing, chaos, random forces of evil that damage our lives, things that we can't explain. And I remember saying that Sunday morning, I don't know why this happened, but I do know that you and I will do something about it. So I, I got a call that week from one of my church members, a parent. She said, you'll never guess what my daughter did. After church on Sunday, when you talked about Hurricane Katrina and all that it had done to devastate lives in New Orleans and other places, we caught her with her little brother and a cooler going down the driveway. And we said, Sarah, where are you going? She said, I'm going to sell Go-Gurts. I got Go-Gurts in the cooler. Those of you who don't know, Go-Gurts like yogurt in a, in a tube that kids tend to like. So she was going to go to the corner and sell Go-Gurts. Why are you doing that? Because we're going to help those people in New Orleans. Eight years old. With her five-year-old brother in tow, by the way. Ready to go out and take on all the evil in the world to do whatever they can. Now, of course, you know what happened. All I had to do was tell that story to the congregation the next Sunday, and the congregation raised $17,000 in one day just to help people in need because that's what children of God do. In the midst of even unexplainable evil, the children of God become instruments of God's healing grace in the world. You don't have to be 60 years old. You can be 8 years old and understand that. And you can be eight years old and do something about it. There's two things we know. In the midst of chaos, God always loves us. God is always with us. And secondly, the other thing we know is God calls us to do something. Let us pray. Holy One, save us from resignation to the power of chaos and evil in the world save us from being paralyzed thinking that we are powerless for we have your power to fight the struggles of life to fight the struggles of our society you have given us your son jesus christ to show us how to love to offer loaves and fishes when it never seems to be enough and yet with your power Multitudes are fed, multitudes are healed. Now is the time we know that we are to be church. We are to be a community of faith that gives witness to your never-failing love and your power to overcome all types of evil. Move within us, Lord, that we as a church might be instruments of your healing grace. May we be that revealing of the children of God that creation can't wait to see. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us continue in a spirit of prayer.
Let us continue now in prayer. Holy God, we are so thankful for your love and for your presence with us throughout all of the chaos of the world. It is so good to know that you are with us through it all and that you have given us the gift of each other and our community so that we can work through and walk through all of the difficult days together. In this community, we have many names and joys and concerns to lift to you, and so we raise them to you now. Holy One, this morning we pray for Ed Orndorff, Betty Orndorff, Harold Ogg, Cheryl Gunderson, for Matt and Jillian Nonnenberg and their new baby Sophie, for Galen and Laura Hines Pierce and their new baby Henry August, and for Mark and Amelia Masden and their new baby Emma Jean, for the family of Brianna Taylor, for Jacob Blake, Anthony Huber's family, and for the family of Joseph Rosenbaum, also for Gage Grosskirks, and the family of George Floyd, for Joyce Fisher, Andrew Reed, Ryland Harris, Lucy Bremer, Andy Chapman, Tom D.C., Ruby Cook, for Dennis, Catherine, and David York, for Joa and Tekla, for Norma Keem, Selena Littman, Maritza Diaz, Holly Ogilvy, for Tara and Neil Keefe, and for the wedding anniversary of Megan, Wolk Jacobs, and Josh Jacobs. And Holy One, this morning, we raise to you all of the students and the teachers who are having to adjust to the chaos of learning online, moving from one platform to another, for all of the stress that that causes, for the students who have had to come home from school, from college, and for all of those who are adjusting to this new way of living, for our new confirmation class, who we will celebrate in a moment, for all of those who are unemployed, for victims of COVID-19 and their families, for victims of wildfires and hurricanes, and for our healthcare workers and first responders, for all of those who are helping to keep us safe and healthy. Holy God, we lift all of these things to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So now we have an awesome opportunity to celebrate together our new confirmation class of 2020 with the salt and light ritual. And so if you would find your online bulletin, if you don't already have it up, towards the end of the ritual, there is a part that we get to say as a congregation. And so from wherever you are this morning, we hope that you will join in and give this prayer and this blessing to our confirmands. And we know that the Spirit of God is going to fill their hearts throughout this process and that they will be able to, through that Holy Spirit, feel your prayers and your love and support this morning from wherever they are as well. Let's join them now. To you, Aiden Bell. Hi. I call forward and introduce to you Jackson Carr. Hi. I call forward and introduce to you Elizabeth Collins. I call forward and introduce to you Amanda Dixon. I 
call forward and introduce to you Gray Masters. Hi. I call forward and introduce to you Rowan McAuliffe. I call forward and introduce to you Corinne Newcomb. Hi. I call forward and introduce to you Josh Newcomb. I call forward and introduce to you Ben Rudolph. Hi. I call forward and introduce to you Braden Simon. I call forward and introduce to you Aiden Wagner. Hi. I call forward and introduce to you Aubrey Wagner. Hi. And all sponsors will join together. We witness to you who stand before you as confirmators. Ready to explore the discipleship, Christ has way to eternal life, and they are prepared to make the covenant they make with you today. Confirmands, do you covenant this day with Christ and his church to be faithful in the practice of spiritual study by your full participation in your confirmation classes? We will. We will. We will. God, so. Confirmands, do you covenant this day with Christ and his church to be faithful in the practice of worship? by your regular attendance in the worship life of this family of faith during this time of exploration. We will live with God, so. Confirmands, do you covenant this day with Christ and his church to be faithful in the practice of works of compassion and justice by participation in the various missions and service opportunities presented to you by your confirmation leaders and teachers. We will. We will. Confirmands, do you covenant this day with Christ and his church to be faithful in the practice of daily prayer and other devotional experiences suggested by your confirmation leaders as a means of opening your heart to God, that God might lead you in the way of truth? We will. And now for the whole congregation. Congregation of Braddock Street Church. These youth stand before you now, committing their year to exploring their faith, asking questions, and discovering what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Will you covenant to journey alongside them? When God will you have to say, we will you listen and hear what you have to say. say. When you reach out to serve others, we will pray for Christ you. As we learn and grow this year, we come to learn and grow as well. Learning and growing from what you share with us, with us. And, learning and learning from, from the new words that God brings into our lives each day. day. We give thanks for your commitment to the journey of faith, faith. and we rejoice in knowing. And in all things, God is with us. And now, as a token of the covenant you have now made between Christ and his church, we present you with these symbols of discipleship, salt and light. Jesus told us long ago that we are to be the salt of the earth and that we are the light of the world. Like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Do not hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. We now place you in the care of your confirmation leaders to explore for yourselves the way of truth, 
love, and faith. Now go and become salt and light. Please join with us now in our closing hymn. Just a couple of things as you go. Um, first of all, next Sunday we're going to engage in service worship. I know that sounds odd at a time when we're not even able to come together to worship, and obviously we can't do much mission work face-to-face -face with people. But we're going to be collecting goods after worship. You can come here by the church. We will be collecting goods for CCAP and for the Winchester Rescue Mission here in Winchester to help those who are most vulnerable especially now during this time of crisis. Another thing we'd like for you to know about is uh, our Healthy Church team recently decided that we are okay with, with allowing small groups to meet outdoors. And uh, even to do that, there are restrictions. So if your small group wants to meet anywhere on the church campus, um, please contact your church leader who needs to contact the church to see what the restrictions are in order for that to happen. Small steps as we move forward, right? But now go to join with these confirmands who are joining alongside of us to be the children of God in a time of chaos, to be instruments of God's healing grace in the world, trusting that God will deliver us and in the meantime empower us to be agents of change and love and grace. Go with the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.